Welcome ZooAssemblyers! My name is Zuka Zalishvili and I'm the founder of ZooAssembly. ZooAssembly is an online podcast for the highest yield basic science and clinical knowledge tested on USMLE Step 1 and USMLE Step 2 CK. The information discussed in this podcast is intended only for educational purposes. It's not intended to prevent, diagnose, or to treat the medical conditions in real clinical practice, nor is it intended to reflect the policy and the guidelines of various health institutions. Simply put, we serve you to butcher your step exams. Please subscribe to our podcast, Facebook, Instagram pages, and the YouTube channels down below in the description of this episode so that we keep you tuned for the news at ZooSMLE. Now, let's start rolling. We are continuing our musculoskeletal series, and in this episode, the first topic that we're going to discuss is the hand muscles. In this subsection, we will specifically discuss the intrinsic hand muscles. And let me tell you that we have already talked about these muscles in the first episode of the musculoskeletal system. However, now we will go into much more detail and we will also review everything that we have discussed about this particular topic in the previous episode. Let's start with thinner and hypothenar eminences. Thinner eminence is the normal bulge at the base of the thumb. Let me remind you from the previous episode that thinner eminence muscles are innervated by median nerve. And I have a question for you guys. Could you please tell me which three functions are executed by the thinner eminence? I really hope that you're saying that thinner eminence performs opposition, abduction, and flexion of the thumb. Accordingly, the three muscles that constitute the thinner eminence are opponens pollicis, abductor pollicis brevis, and flexor pollicis brevis. Let me draw your attention to one important thing. When we listed these muscles, we just said opponens pollicis. We haven't said opponens pollicis brevis or opponens pollicis longus. This means that each hand has only one opponens pollicis muscle. The muscle that is responsible for the opposition of the thumb against all the other fingers. The clinical implication of this point is that if the patient has median nerve injury resulting in thinner atrophy, this patient will completely lose the ability to oppose the thumb against the other fingers. This can be easily tested by asking the patient to hold the paper between his or her thumb and the index finger. When we hold the paper in that position, this posture, sorry, position of the fingers requires the opposition of the thumb against the index finger. So if thinner eminence is atrophied due to median nerve lesion, then the patient won't be able to oppose the thumb against the index finger. This is in contrast to the flexion and abduction of the thumb. We mentioned that thinner eminence is composed of flexor pollicis brevis, which in Latin means short, and abductor pollicis brevis. Whenever we have the muscle ending in brevis, it means that the same muscle, uh, there's also a muscle which is longer than the muscle that we are talking about. In other words, we have flexor pollicis brevis and flexor pollicis longus, which in Latin means long. So if the patient has thinner atrophy due to median nerve lesion, yes, flexor pollicis brevis and abductor pollicis brevis will be denervated 
and dysfunctional. However, the long muscles performing the same function will compensate for the loss of the short muscles. And one more high yield thing about the thinner eminence is that not all muscular structures in the thinner eminence are innervated by the median nerve. Yes, almost all muscles are innervated by median nerve, but here's the thing. The flexor pollicis brevis has two heads, superficial head and the deep head. Now, median nerve innervates only the superficial head of the flexor pollicis brevis muscle. The deep head of that muscle is innervated by the ulnar nerve. So to summarize, there is one head of a specific muscle in the thinner eminence that's innervated by the ulnar nerve. Let's move on to the hypothenar eminence. And let me ask you a question from our previous musculoskeletal system episode. Guys, could you please remind me which nerve innervates the muscles of the hypothenar eminence? That's absolutely true. It's the ulnar nerve. And the hypothenar eminence performs the same functions as the thinner eminence, but for the pinky finger. Because hypothenar eminence is the normal muscle bulge at the base of the pinky finger. And if you remember, in the previous episode, we also mentioned the mnemonic by which we can remember the muscles of thinner and hypothenar eminences. This is the OAF, O-A-F. So pose, abduct, and flex. Therefore, hypothenar eminence consists of opponens digiti minimi, abductor digiti minimi, and the flexor digiti minimi. Right. Now let's briefly mention the interossei muscles. There are two groups of interossei muscles, the dorsal and palmar. Zoe Semuliers, could you please remind me what the function is of the dorsal interossei muscles? Are you saying that dorsal interossei muscles abduct the fingers? If you are, that's totally correct. And let me also remind you the mnemonic for this. Mnemonic was DEB. D stands for dorsal interossei muscles and EB stands for abduction. Now in contrast, the palmar interossei muscles are responsible for finger adduction. And the mnemonic for this is PED. P stands for palmar interossei, while ed stands for adduction. And one more question for you guys. Do you remember which nerve innervates both groups of the interossei muscles? That's right. Mm -hmm. It's the ulnar nerve. And the last group of intrinsic muscles, intrinsic hand muscles that we are going to discuss in this subsection is the lumbricals. Before we talk about the function of the lumbricals, let's mention the fact that the thumb does not have the lumbrical muscle, and that's totally normal. In other words, the first lumbrical is the lumbrical at the base of the index finger. And then we have second, third, and the fourth lumbrical muscle. And the fourth lumbrical muscle is at the base of the pinky finger. Now, could you please tell me what the normal function of the lumbrical muscles are? Louder, please. Yes, yes, that's right. They flex at MCP joints and they extend at the PIP and DIP joints. And if you remember, I taught you the easy way to remember the function of the lumbrical muscles. So if you flex your MCP joint joints, sorry, and if you extend the PIP and DIP joints on your hand, then you will receive 
the configuration of the inverse L with your finger. So this inverse L will remind you that this is what the normal lumbricals do, because lumbricals also start with the letter L. Okay, this was discussion of the intrinsic hand muscles. Let's move on to the distortions of the hand. In this subsection, we'll talk about the four conditions. These include the ulnar claw, hand of benediction, median claw, and the okay gesture. Before we start talking about these conditions in detail, let me tell you one thing. When you look at the position of the fingers of the hand, ulnar claw and the hand of benediction are identical. On the other hand, medium claw and the okay gesture are identical in terms of how they look like uh, on the hand. The way we can differentiate these conditions from each other is to find out the context of this position. What I mean here is that we should know whether the hand assumes this position while extending the fingers or at rest or while flexing the fingers or making a fist. Another general rule of thumb that I'd like to share with you about the distortions of the hand is that if you hear the word claw in the name, it always means that it's the distal lesion and it always means that the lumbricals are impaired. Let me tell you one easy way to remember these associations. This is what I use, so you are welcome to use it if it proves helpful for you. The word claw contains the letter L, and this reminds me that the word distal also contains the letter L. So every time the distortion of the hand contains the word claw, it's always the distal lesion. And similarly, the word lumbricals contain the letter L. So you can see that all these three words contain the letter L, claw, distal, and the lumbricals. Right, and then in contrast, the uh, distortions of the hand, which do not contain the word claw in their names, are due to proximal lesions and they affect the finger flexor muscles. The way I remember this is that both these words, proximal and flexor, contain the letter X. Proximal and flexor. Okay, let's go down and talk about these different types of distortions of the hands. And the first one is the ulnar claw. Before I tell you the info about the ulnar claw, let me ask you a question based on the information that I gave you several minutes ago. When we say ulnar claw, can you tell me whether it's distal or proximal ulnar nerve lesion? That's right, it's the distal ulnar nerve lesion because the name ulnar claw contains the word claw. And can you tell me which muscles are affected in this distortion? Is it the lumbricals or finger flexors? Louder, please. That's absolutely correct. The lumbricals are affected in the ulnar claw because once again, the name contains the word claw and then lumbricals contain the letter L. So both of these words contain the letter L. Uh, to summarize, the ulnar claw is the distal ulnar nerve lesion which affects the third and fourth lumbricals, meaning the lumbrical muscles of the ring finger and the pinky finger. The distal ulnar nerve lesion can happen due to compression of the ulnar nerve in Guillain Canal, and that commonly happens in cyclists who 
make, make the movements with the hands and they might compress the ulnar nerve in the Guillain canal. But at the same time, let's remind ourselves from the previous musculoskeletal episode that the fracture of the hook of hamate bone can also induce the ulnar neuropathy. This is because the ulnar nerve goes right under the hook of hamate. And the ulnar claw is characterized by extension of the MCP joints at the ring finger and pinky finger and flexion of the PIP and the IP joints at the ring finger and the pinky finger. And that happens when the patient is extending the fingers or when the patient is at rest. This is because the lumbricals don't work for the ring finger and the pinky finger and they assume the position that we described right now. Okay, let's move on to hand of benediction because as we already mentioned, the hand of benediction looks identical to ulnar claw, but the context of when the hand assumes this position is different. Let me ask you a question. Since the name hand of benediction does not involve the word claw, is it the proximal nerve lesion or the distal nerve lesion? I hope that you're telling me that it's the proximal hand, uh, the nerve lesion. And if it's proximal nerve lesion, then could you please also tell me which muscles are affected, the lumbricals or the finger flexors? If you remember, we said that whenever the proximal part of the nerve is injured, then it affects the finger flexors because both words proximo and flexor contain the letter X. Hand of benediction is due to the proximal injury of the median nerve and it affects the flexors of the thumb, index finger and the middle finger. Therefore, when the patient with hand of benediction tries to make a fist, then the ring finger and the pinky finger will flex normally because the flexion of the ring and pinky fingers is mediated by the ulnar nerve. However, while the patient is trying to flex all of the fingers, the thumb, index finger and the middle finger will not be able to flex because their flexion is mediated by the median nerve and in the hand of benediction, the proximal lesion of the median nerve is what's responsible for this position. Okay, and the last question that I have for you about the hand of benediction is this. Could you please remind me what trauma or what fracture can predispose the patient to the proximal median nerve injury? Louder, please. Yes, that's right. It's the supracondylar fracture of the humerus. Because, as we mentioned in the previous episode, the median nerve, along with the brachial artery, rests on top of the humerus. And if we have the supracondylar fracture, this can damage the median nerve with the possible damage of the brachial artery. Let's move on to the median claw. Again, so since the word, uh, since the name median claw contains the word claw, we already know that this is the distal nerve injury. And specifically, this is due to the distal median nerve injury. Similarly, since the name median claw contains the word claw, we also know that the muscle group affected in this distortion is the lumbricals, the lumbricals innervated by the median nerve. Now let me ask you a question. Can you please recall 
which lumbricals are affected, not affected, but innervated by the median nerve. That's right. This is the first lumbrical at the base of the index finger and the second lumbrical at the base of the middle finger. In the median claw, the person will have flexion of the PIP and DIP joints and extension of the MCP joints of the index finger and the middle finger. This is because the first and second lumbricals no longer work. And very importantly, the median claw occurs when the patient is trying to extend the fingers or when the hand is at rest. This is when the dysfunction of the lumbricals is most prominent. Now let's compare the median claw to OK gesture. OK gesture, as we already mentioned, has the same hand position and the finger position that the median claw. However, the nerve that's damaged here is different and the, the site of the nerve damage is also different. Since the name OK gesture does not contain the word claw, this tells us that the lesion, the nerve lesion, is proximal rather than distal. And specifically, OK gesture is due to the proximal ulnar nerve lesion. Similarly, since the name OK gesture does not contain the word claw, this tells us that the affected muscle group is the finger flexors. So proximal lesion affects the finger flexor muscles. And could you please remind me the flexors of which fingers are innervated by the ulnar nerve? I hope you're telling me that these are the finger flexors for the ring finger and the pinky finger. Therefore, when the patient is trying to make a fist by flexing all the fingers, he or she will be absolutely able to flex the thumb, index, and the middle finger because they are innervated by the median nerve. However, she or he will not be able to flex the ring finger and the pinky finger because the ulnar nerve is damaged proximally. And the last question that I have for you about distortions is this. Could you please remind me from the previous episode what trauma or fracture can predispose the patient to the proximal ulnar nerve injury? That's absolutely true. It's the medial epicondylar fracture of the humerus. It's also known as the funny bone fracture. And this is because the ulnar nerve goes right under the medial epicondyle. So if the patient experiences the fracture of the medial epicondyle, this can compress the ulnar nerve in the ulnar groove, which is immediately under the medial epicondyle. So this was our discussion about the distortions of the hand. Let's now discuss the actions of the hip muscles. The first uh, group of muscles that I'd like to discuss with you is the hip abductors. Hip abduction is when we push the hip to the side and hip abduction is mediated by two muscles. This is gluteus medius and gluteus minimus. Both of these muscles along with gluteus maximus are located on the outer side of the ilium. On the other hand, the adduction of the hip is mediated logically by the adductor muscles. And we have three adductor muscles here. This is adductor magnus, adductor longus, and adductor brevis. This is probably the simplest group to remember because the name of each of these muscles 
in, uh, indicates what they perform, what action they perform. They all perform the a deduction of the hip. Now the extensors of the hip are gluteus maximus, semitendinosus, and semimembranosus muscles. Hip extension is when we push our hip to the back. And we already mentioned the position of the gluteus maximus that's on the outer side of the ilium. But let's talk about the semitendinosus and semimembranosus. Semitendinosus and semimembranosus are the parts of the hamstring muscles. And the hamstring muscles are located at the posterior hip compartment. Other than the semitendinosus and semimembranosus muscles, there is one more muscle uh, which is the component of the hamstring muscle group. This is the biceps femoris. And also the part of the adductor magnus can be considered as the component of the uh, hamstring muscles, but that's not as important as the first three muscles that we already said. Generally, the function of the hamstring muscles is to flex the knee and extend the hip. If you imagine the position of these muscles, and if you imagine what happens when hamstring muscles contract, then it's very easy to remember their function. When they contract, they will pull the knee towards themselves, and this will cause the knee flexion. But if they contract further, this will push the hip to the back, so they will extend the hip. Now let's move on to the hip flexor muscles. These muscles include iliopsoas muscle, rectus femoris, which is the part of the quadriceps femoris muscle, tensor fasciolata, pectineus, and sartorius. Let's take a step back and talk about the quadriceps femoris and sartorius muscles. Quadriceps femoris is the muscle in the anterior thigh compartment. And quadriceps femoris is responsible for knee extension and the hip flexion. If you remember from the anatomy, the quadriceps tendon inserts on the patella and then patella is continuous with the patellar tendon, which inserts on the tibial tuberosity. Now, let's imagine how quadriceps femoris contracts. When it contracts, this will pull the patellar tendon upwards, and this motion will cause the knee extension. Now, if the quadriceps femoris continues to contract further, then this will push the hip to the front, and this will be uh, the, the hip flexion. As for the sartorius, this is the longest muscle in our body, and there is one high yield thing about the sartorius muscle. Sartorius muscle is the only muscle that simultaneously flexes the hip and the knee. Now let's contrast this to the quadriceps femoris and the hamstring muscles that we have already discussed. As we've said, the hamstring muscles cause knee extension, sorry, knee flexion and hip extension, right? It's flexion and extension. In contrast, the quadriceps femoris muscle causes knee extension and hip flexion. So it's extension and flexion. Now sartorius causes knee flexion and hip flexion. So it's flexion and flexion. Right, then the other group of the hip muscles is the internal rotators. And the internal rotation is mediated by three muscles. This is gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, and tensor fascia laxa. If you remember, gluteus medius and minimus are also responsible for the hip abduction while tensor fasciolata is also responsible for the hip 
flexion. And the last uh, action of the hip muscles that we're going to discuss here is the external rotation. External rotation is mediated by the four muscles. These include the iliopsoas muscle, gluteus maximus, piriformis muscle, and the obturator muscles. So this was discussion about the actions of the hip muscles. The last topic that we are going to discuss in this episode is the lower extremity nerves and their innervation. In the previous episode, we discussed the brachial plexus and all the muscles of the upper extremities innervated by the brachial plexus nerves. Just like the upper extremities, the lower extremities also need the vast innervation because we constantly use our lower extremities to simply walk, to at least walk, right? And the lower extremities are innervated by the nerves arising from the lumbosacral plexus. And if we break down the nerve, if we break down the name itself, then we'll be able to analyze which roots make up the lumbosacral plexus. Well, lumbar part of this plexus is created by the lumbar spinal nerves, right? So from L1 to L5. And then the sacral plexus, the sacral part of this plexus, is created by the sacral nerves. And here we have the lumbosacral plexus. Let's talk about the individual nerves here. And let's also talk about what they innervate. We are not going to discuss the exact anatomy of the lumbosacral plexus because first, it's not as high yield for the step one as the anatomy of the brachial plexus. Second, it's much more complex than the anatomy of the brachial plexus. What is absolutely high yield for step one is to know the different nerves and their innervation um, and also the results of their injury. The first lower extremity nerve that we're going to talk about is the iliohypogastric nerve. Iliohypogastric nerve is created by the fibers from T12 and L1 spinal nerves. The sensory innervation of the iliohypogastric nerve is the skin over the suprapubic region. At the same time, the iliohypogastric nerve has the motor innervation, and the motor innervation is the innervation of two abdominal wall muscles. This is transversus abdominis, the innermost abdominal wall muscle, and the internal oblique, which is the middle abdominal wall muscle. The clinical scenario when iliohypogastric nerve is damaged typically is the abdominal surgery. This is because abdominal surgery typically requires the penetration of the abdominal wall muscles and the penetration of the abdominal wall muscles by the surgical instruments can damage the iliohypogastric nerve. The results of iliohypogastric neuropathy are very logical. We already mentioned that iliohypogastric nerve arising from T12 to L1 nerve roots innervates the skin over the suprapubic region. So, if we have the damage of this nerve, then the patient will experience the tingling or burning sensation in the surgical incision site, which radiates towards the suprapubic and inguinal region. Okay, let's move on to the next nerve, which is genitofemoral nerve. Genitofemoral nerve is created by the fibers or the axons coming from the L1 and L2 spinal nerves. And as the name implies, genital femoral nerve has something to do with the genitalia and the thigh. And let's talk about the normal function of the genital femoral nerve. First, the sensory function 
is the innervation of the skin over scrotum in the males, labia majora in females, and the skin over medial thigh in both males and females. The motor innervation of the genitofemoral nerve is the innervation of the cremasteric muscle. Let me remind you that cremasteric muscle is the muscle that elevates the testicle during the cremasteric reflex. Cremasteric reflex is elicited by stroking the inner or medial part of the thigh. And now we can understand how the cremasteric reflex, reflex is, is elicited. When we stroke the medial thigh, we stimulate the sensory fibers in the genital femoral nerve. But the activation of the genital femoral nerve itself will also activate the motor fibers in this nerve. And this will result in elevation of the ipsilateral testicle. The common scenario in which the genital femoral nerve gets damaged is the laparoscopic surgery. And if the patient has genital femoral neuropathy, then she or he will have the decreased sensation over the upper medial thigh and upper anterior thigh immediately under the inguinal ligament. So th this area coincides with the lateral part of the femoral triangle. Additionally, the patient with genital femoral nerve injury will have the absent cremasteric reflex. Now, let me ask you one question. Guys, could you please tell me which condition, testicular condition, presents with the absent cremasteric reflex? That's so cool. This is really cool. You're right, it's the testicular torsion. This is because when the testicle uh, just undergoes the torsion around the spermatic cord, this will cause ischemia to the motor fibers of the femoral nerve, and this will disable the chromasteric reflex. The next nerve that we're going to discuss right now is the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Lateral femoral, femoral cutaneous nerve arises from the axons coming from the L2, L3 spinal nerves. And now let's think about the name of this nerve for a second. It's lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. As the name implies, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve innervates the skin over the lateral thigh. This is the major area of the innervation of this nerve, but it also innervates the part of the anterior thigh. So to summarize, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve innervates the skin over the lateral and anterior thigh. The scenarios in which the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve might be damaged are the ones when this nerve can be compressed under the inguinal ligament. Normally, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is the most lateral structure that goes under the inguinal ligament. So if the patient wears the tight clothes or if the patient is obese or pregnant, or the patient undergoes the pelvic procedures, all of these conditions can compress this nerve under the inguinal ligament. And if the patient has damage to the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, then we get the condition that's called moralgia peristatica. Moralgia peristatica literally means thigh pain and paresthesias. So meros means thigh, algia means pain, and paresthetica means paresthesia, so tingling and burning sensation. This is what the patient will experience in the sensory distribution of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. She or he will have the pain and tingling and burning sensation over the lateral thigh. 
The next nerve that we're going to discuss is the obturator nerve. The obturator nerve arises from the axons, sorry, it arises from the L2, L3, and L4 spinal nerves. The obturator nerve innervates the skin over the medial thigh. This is the sensory innervation of the obturator nerve. Now, the motor innervation is more complex and interesting. First, obturator nerve innervates the adductor muscles. It innervates adductor longus, adductor brevis, and adductor magnus. It also innervates two more muscles. This is pectineus and obturator externus muscles. For all intents and purposes, it's enough to know that obturator muscle, obturator nerve, sorry, innervates the adductor muscles in order to analyze the results of obturator neuropathy. However, if you also know the pectineus and obturator externus, that's amazing. The scenario in which obturator nerve commonly gets damaged is the pelvic surgery because this nerve is, in, is uh, located in the pelvis and the neurological deficits will be very logical. First, since the obturator nerve innervates the skin over the medial thigh, then the patient with obturator neuropathy will have decreased medial thigh sensation. On the other hand, since the obturator nerve innervates mostly the adductor muscles, then the patient with obturator neuropathy will not be able to adduct the thigh. So it will be the, the uh, result of obturator neuropathy will be decreased thigh adduction. Okay, this was obturator nerve. Now let's move on to the femoral nerve. Now the femoral nerve also arises from L2, L3, and L4 spinal nerves. The sensory innervation of the femoral nerve is the skin, involves the skin over the anterior thigh and the medial leg. The medial leg, the skin over the medial leg, is innervated specifically by the saphenous nerve. Saphenous nerve is the continuation of the femoral nerve. The motor innervation of the femoral nerve includes mostly the muscles of the anterior thigh compartment. The most important muscle innervated by the femoral nerve is the quadriceps femoris muscle. But other than the quadriceps femoris, iliacus, pectineus, and sartorius are also innervated by the femoral nerve. The scenario in which femoral nerve gets damaged is usually the pelvic fracture. And then the results of the femoral neuropathy are also very logical. We mentioned that the femoral nerve innervates the muscles of the anterior thigh compartment, for example, quadriceps femoris. Based on what we have discussed so far, could you please remind me the normal function of the quadriceps femoris muscle? I really, really hope that you're telling me that the quadriceps femoris muscle extends the knee and flexes the hip. So whenever the patient has femoral neuropathy, she or he will have decreased knee extension and decreased patellar reflex. This is because patellar reflex involves the reflex extension of the knee in response to the reflex hammer uh, just hitting the patellar tendon. If you took notice, I have not said that the patient with femoral neuropathy will have decreased hip flexion. And there is a reason behind this. Hip flexion is mediated by many, many muscles. So here we have iliopsoas, rectus femoris, tensor fasciolata, pectineus, and sartorius. While some of these muscles 
will be affected in femoral neuropathy, not all of them will become denervated. Therefore, the hip flexion will be more or less maintained in case of the femoral neuropathy. Now let's move on to the sciatic nerve, which is the largest nerve coming from the lumbosacral plexus. Sciatic nerve arises from the axons coming from the L4, L5, S1, S2, and S3 spinal nerves. So it's truly a lumbosacral nerve because it contains the fibers from the lumbar nerves and the sac sacral nerves. Sciatic nerve, in a sense, is not a nerve. I know it sounds strange, but let me explain what I mean. Sciatic nerve is the collection of two nerves under one sheath. So there are two nerves which are covered by the same epineurium, and this is what we call the sciatic nerve. The sciatic nerve consists of the common peroneal nerve and the tibial nerve. And the sciatic nerve innervates the hamstring muscles. Hamstring muscles, let me remind you, are located in the posterior thigh compartment. Okay, I have a question for you guys. Could you please tell me which muscles create the hamstring group? That's totally correct. So this is semitendinosus, semimembranosus, biceps femoris, and adductor magnus, the part of the adductor magnus. There is one caveat that I'd like to draw your attention to. Please don't confuse biceps femoris and the rectus femoris. They sound similar, but they are two different muscles. Biceps femoris is the part of the hamstring muscles, and it's located at the back of the thigh. So, biceps femoris at the back of the thigh. In contrast, the rectus femoris is the part of the quadriceps muscle, and therefore is located at the front of the thigh. Okay, uh, now... As we already mentioned in this episode, the normal function of the hamstring muscles is the knee flexion and hip extension. So this is what the sciatic nerve normally does. The common scenario in which sciatic nerve can get damaged is the herniated disc. As we know, the disc intervertebral disc herniation is most common at the lumbar region because this is the region of the vertebral column which experiences the highest pressure right the body weight totally rests on the lumbar vertebrae additionally posterior hip dislocation can also damage the sciatic nerve this is because the sciatic nerve is located behind the femur and so if the sciatic nerve is damaged, then we will have the loss of many functions. So, like other than the loss of the hamstring muscle function, we will have the loss of the functions of both tibial nerve and the common fibular or common peroneal nerve. And now let's talk about these two muscles. This is common peroneal nerve and then the tibial nerve. Common peroneal nerve is also known as the common fibular nerve. And the common peroneal nerve, as we already mentioned, arises from the sciatic nerve. However, the spinal nerves that give rise to the common peroneal nerve include L4, L5, S1, and S2. What I'm trying to say here is that common peroneal nerve does not contain the fibers from the S3 spinal nerve. Uh, at the popliteal fossa, which is the back region of the knee, the sciatic nerve divides into the common peroneal nerve and the tibial nerve. And the common peroneal nerve then just 
runs around the fibular neck and it goes into the anterior and lateral leg compartments. The common peroneal nerve divides into superficial and deep peroneal nerves. There is one general rule of thumb that I'd like to share with you and this will help you remember the innervation of the superficial peroneal nerve and the deep peroneal nerve. The superficial peroneal nerve is superficial, therefore it innervates more of the skin rather than the muscles. In other words, superficial peroneal nerve mostly has the cutaneous innervation. It innervates the skin over the lateral leg, also the skin over the anterior leg, and the skin over the dorsum of the foot except for the web space between the big toe and the second digit. The motor innervation of this superficial peroneal nerve is the innervation of the lateral leg compartment. Let me tell you that the lateral leg compartment is composed of two muscles mostly. This is peroneus longus and peroneus brevis. So long and short peroneus muscles. And peroneus longus and brevis are responsible for the foot aversion. Aversion is therefore mediated by the superficial peroneal nerve. In contrast, the deep peroneal nerve is deep, therefore it innervates more muscles rather than the skin. It innervates the entire anterior leg compartment. And the most important muscle in the anterior leg compartment is the tibialis anterior. Guys, I have one question for you. Could you please tell me what the normal motor function of the anterior leg compartment is? I really hope that you're telling me that the normal motor functions of the anterior leg compartment are the foot dorsiflexion and finger extension on the foot. And this is what the deep peroneal nerve is responsible for. And then as for the sensory innervation of deep peroneal nerve, it innervates the first dorsal web space on the foot. This is the web space between the big toe and the second digit. All the other skin over the dorsum foot, dorsum of the foot, is innervated by the superficial peroneal nerve. Now let's talk about how the patient can get the common peroneal nerve injury. As we already mentioned, the common fibular nerve winds around the fibular neck. And this happens on the lateral, upper lateral aspect of the leg immediately below the knee. So if the patient has either trauma or compression of the lateral aspect of the leg, let's say from the tight cast, this can cause the fibular neuropathy. At the same time, if the patient has fibular neck fracture, this can also result in common peroneal neuropathy. And again, this is because the common peroneal nerve winds around the fibular neck. Let's talk about what the symptoms and signs will be in case of common peroneal neuropathy. As we already mentioned, common peroneal nerve is responsible for foot aversion and dorsiflexion. And if the peroneal nerve is injured, then the foot cannot be averted and in, in, in return it will be inverted at rest. Additionally, since the foot cannot be dorsiflexed, it will be plantar flexed at rest. So the foot will be inverted and plantar flexed at rest. But at the same time, the patient will exhibit the foot drop. This is the specific type of gait, stepage gait, when the patient drops the foot right before she or he wants to put the foot on the ground.
ground. So here's the thing. When we walk and we want to put the foot on the ground, immediately before putting the foot on the ground, we perform the foot dorsiflexion. So we put the foot on the ground with the heel of the foot. But then the people with common peroneal nerve injury or deep peroneal nerve injury cannot do that. They cannot dorsiflex their foot. So what they do is that they drop their foot. And this is a very, very specific type of gait. I would like to encourage you to Google the uh, foot drop and maybe watch the YouTube videos of how these patients are affected. Because once you see the foot drop, you will never forget how it looks like. Let's move on to the tibial nerve right now. The tibial nerve, as we already talked about, arises from the sciatic nerve. Sciatic nerve divides into common fibular nerve and the tibial nerve at the level of the upper popliteal fossa, the back part of the knee. The tibial nerve arises from the spinal nerves L4, L5, S1, S2, and S3. The sensory innervation of the tibial nerve is the sole of the foot. The sensation on the so foot sole is mediated completely by the tibial nerve. And then the tibial nerve mostly innervates the posterior leg compartment muscles. This is the motor innervation of the tibial nerve. It innervates the muscle called triceps surae muscle. Triceps surae muscle is the muscle composed of two heads of gastrocnemius and one head of soleus. And this muscle is located at the back of the leg, behind the shins. Uh, triceps surae muscle is responsible for the plantar flexion and um, yeah, so it's, it's mostly responsible for the plantar flexion of the foot and also curling of the toes or the finger flexion of the foot. Additionally, the tibial nerve innervates the long head of the biceps femoris, that's the part of the hamstring muscles. It innervates the plantaris muscle, popliteus muscle, and then flexor muscles of the foot that we already mentioned. So since the tibial nerve arises at the level of the knee, the knee trauma can cause the tibial nerve injury. For example, if the pa patient experiences the posterior knee dislocation, this can compress the tibial nerve at the back of the knee. At the same time, the condition called Baker cyst can also induce tibial neuropathy. We will talk about Baker cyst in much more detail in the following episodes, but for this discussion, let me tell you that Baker cyst is the bulge at the back of the knee due to the fluid transudation from the knee joint space. And this can compress the tibial nerve, which will cause the proximal tibial nerve injury. The distal tibial nerve injury will happen at the level of the tarsal tunnel. This condition is called the tarsal tunnel syndrome. The tarsal tunnel is the space behind the medial malleolus of the foot. This is where the tibial nerve goes into, and this is the space from where the tibial nerve goes into the sole of the foot. So if the patient experiences tarsal tunnel syndrome, that's the distal lesion of the tibial nerve. The tibial nerve performs two important functions, that's inversion of the foot and plantar flexion. So it means that if the patient has tibial neuropathy, then the patient can no longer plantar flex her or his feet. The plantar flexion is necessary to stand or walk on the tiptoes. Because if you imagine the person standing on the tiptoes, the person should maintain her or his feet in the plantar flexion. And this is what the people with tibial neuropathy cannot do. So they cannot walk on the tiptoes. At the same time, uh, all the patients with tibial neuropathy, regardless of whether it's distal or proximal lesion, 
will have inability to curl the toes because they lose the motor function of the finger flexors and they will lose the sensation on the sole of the foot. And only in the proximal lesion, the foot will be averted at rest. This is because the inversion is weakened and disabled. Okay, now let's move on to the superior gluteal nerve. Superior gluteal nerve arises from the spinal nerves L4, L5, and S1. And the superior gluteal nerve innervates three muscles. It only has the motor innervation. The three muscles innervated by the superior gluteal nerve include gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, and the tensor fascia laxa. The mechanism of injury of the superior gluteal nerve is extremely high yield. This is the, the superior gluteal nerve gets damaged when the nurse or the physician erroneously does the injection, intramuscular injection, in the superomedial gluteal region. This is because the superior gluteal nerve runs immediately under the superomedial gluteal region. And this is the reason why we should always do injection in the buttock in the superolateral quadrant, preferably in the anterolateral region of the superolateral quadrant. This is because the superolateral quadrant does not contain much nerves underneath it, and therefore there is the minimal risk of damaging a significant nerve with the superolateral injection. Okay, now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of the superior gluteal nerve injury. And the most important thing to understand here is the Trendelenburg sign, which is also known as the Trendelenburg gait. Before we do this, let's take a step back and explain the normal function of the gluteus medius and minimus. Gluteus medius and minimus, located on the outer side of the ilium, are responsible for maintaining the normal horizontal position of the pelvis when we, when we elevate one of our legs. For example, if we elevate our left leg and stand on our right leg, normally the pelvis should stay horizontal. And this will be due to the normal function of the gluteus medius and minimus. Now, when the patient has superior gluteal nerve injury, then gluteus medius and minimus are denervated. Therefore, if we elevate one leg, then the contralateral gluteus medius and minimus can no longer maintain the horizontal position of the pelvis. So let's say that the patient has right-sided superior gluteal nerve injury. Now, this means that the right-sided gluteus medius and minimus are denervated. Normally, the right-sided gluteus medius and minimus are, re are responsible for maintaining the horizontal pelvic position when we elevate the left leg. Now, if this patient elevates the left leg, then the hip will drop towards the left side due to the effect of the gravity. And usually, the patient tilts the trunk opposite to the side of the hip drop. This is kind of compensatory movement in order to correct the hip alignment. So if the hip drops to the left, then the patient will be inclined to tilt the trunk towards the right side. It's very high yield to remember that the lesion of the superior gluteal nerve is always contralateral to the side of the hip that drops. So if the left hip drops, then it's the right superior gluteal nerve injury. And the, the lesion is always ipsilateral to the extremity on which the patient stands. So in the example that we've discussed so far, 
If the patient stands on the right foot and the left hip drops, it means that the injury is ipsilateral to the right foot. So it's the right-sided superior gluteal nerve injury. Before we move on to another nerve, let me tell you one thing. It's very important that we do not confuse the Trendelenburg sign with Trendelenburg position. Trendelenburg position is the position of the patient on the operating table when the feet of the patient are located at the higher level than the head. In contrast, the reverse Trendelenburg position is the position of the patient on the operating table when the head is located at the higher level than the feet. But again, neither Trendelenburg position nor reverse Trendelenburg position has anything to do with Trendelenburg sign that's related to superior gluteal nerve injury. Okay, now we'll move on to the inferior gluteal nerve. Inferior gluteal nerve arises from the spinal nerves L5, S1, and S2. Remembering the muscle innervated by the inferior gluteal nerve and the signs of the inferior gluteal neuropathy is really easy. There is only one muscle innervated by the inferior gluteal nerve, and this is gluteus maximus. Let's take a step back and emphasize one important thing. As we discussed before, gluteus medius and minimus are innervated by the superior gluteal nerve. In contrast, the gluteus maximus is innervated by the inferior gluteal nerve. And the common scenario in which the inferior gluteal nerve gets damaged is the posterior hip dislocation. This is because the inferior gluteal nerve is also located behind the hip. So if hip is dislocated posteriorly, this can compress the inferior gluteal nerve. I have a question for you guys. Could you please remind me from our today's episode what the normal function of gluteus maximus is? A louder, please? A little louder? That's right. It's hip extension. Therefore, any patient with inferior gluteal neuropathy will have difficulty extending the hip. Let's think about when we need the hip extension. First, we need to extend our hips sequentially when we climb the stairs. Therefore, the patients with inferior gluteal neuropathy will have difficulty climbing the stairs. Additionally, we need to extend our hips whenever we rise from the seated position. This means that the patients with inferior gluteal neuropathy will also have difficulty rising from the seated position. Okay. Now let's move on to the last nerve of the lumbosacral plexus that we are going to discuss in this episode, and this is the pudendal nerve. The pudendal nerve arises from the spinal nerves S2, S3, and S4. The sensory innervation of the pudendal nerve involves the skin over the perineum. Perineum, as we know, is this uh, space between the legs. As for the motor innervation of the pudendal nerve, it innervates external urethral sphincter and external anal sphincter. Therefore, the pudendal nerve is responsible for urinary continence and the fecal continence. The scenarios in which the pudendal nerve gets damaged include the stretch injury during the childbirth. When the woman undergoes the vaginal delivery, if the baby is too large for the female pelvis, then this might cause tearing of the tissues, including the pudendal nerve, resulting in pudendal neuropathy after the delivery. Additionally, prolonged cycling and horseback riding 
can also induce the pudendal nerve injury. The results of the pudendal neuropathy are very logical based on the functions that we've discussed before. First, pudendal neuropathy will be marked by decreased sensation in the perineum because that's the nerve which innervates perineum and the genital area as well. At the same time, the pudendal nerve injury can result in urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, or both. This is because pudendal nerve, as we already mentioned, innervates the external urethral sphincter and external anal sphincter. The last high yield point, the clinical point about the pudendal nerve is that we can perform the pudendal nerve block during the childbirth. This is, in, this is done in order to achieve the local anesthesia. And it's very high yield to remember that pudendal nerve block is performed by injecting the local anesthetic intravaginally with the needle pointing the ischial spine. The ischial spine here is the highest yield part. So, the idea is that the pudendal nerve is anatomically located next to the ischial spine. And if we want to perform the pudendal nerve block, then the intravaginal needle should be directed towards the ischial spine. Okay, so we've discussed many topics today and we've come to an end of our today's episode. Let's summarize everything that we've discussed today. In this episode, we have discussed the intrinsic hand muscles initially. We talked about the lumbricals, the interossei, and also, we talked about the thinner and hypothenar eminences. Then we continued our episode by discussing the distortions of the hand. And this is where we discussed the four different types of the hand distortions. After this, we talked about the actions of the hip muscles. And then we finished off our episode by discussing the lower extremity nerves. You can leave the voice message on this episode to let us know how we can improve our podcast for you. So thank you for your kind attention to Assemble Ears and see you on the next episode.